Hey guys, so this video is going to cover 10-2 simplifying radicals. There's a lot that we're going to be covering, so by all means, this is a video that is probably meant to be paused and rewatched and rewatched again and again. The first thing you need to remember is that the word radical is now going to be used, and that defines the radical sign. So the square root sign is also called the radical symbol. So please remember that because I will be using the word radical throughout this video. Here's your goal. You will get square roots that are not perfect squares, like the number 48. You could always square root it on a calculator and you would get your decimal answer, but that's not what we're trying to do here. What we're going to do instead is take the number 48 and we are going to split it into two factors that multiply to give us 48. Now there are many ways that you can get 48. 2 times 24, 1 times 48, 6 times 8. But what you want to try to look for is the largest perfect square that could divide 48. And by perfect square, I'm talking about 16. 16 times 3 is 48, and 16 is the largest perfect square that divides 48. So we will rewrite 48 as 16 times 3. The next part of the problem is very, very simple. Your 16 is a perfect square, so you can square root it to get 4. And then the 3, because it's not a perfect square, stays under the radical sign. And that's how you get your answer, 4 times the square root of 3. And this is the simplified version of the problem. So here's what we're looking at. We have these radical expressions, like you just saw. Here are three that are already simplified. What you'll notice is that because the 5 in that first example, 3 times the square root of 5, because 5 is prime, you know you're done. Anytime your radical has a prime number underneath it, that means you are going to be done with simplifying. The middle example, you uh, cannot simplify that x anymore because it's already being raised to the first power. So if the x were maybe raised to the second or third power, you would be able to simplify it, simplify it, which you'll be seeing in the later part of the video. The third part, you have a fraction, but specifically the denominator doesn't have a radical sign in it, so we're okay. If there were a radical sign in the denominator, we wouldn't be good. So here's some non-examples. The first one you can see here, 3 times the square root of 12, that is not simplified because 12 has a perfect square that will divide it, specifically 4. Because 4 could be square rooted to give you a 2 and a 2, that means the 12 could be simplified further, so it's not simplified all the way. The middle expression, the uh, fraction underneath the radical sign, that's not allowed. You can't have a fraction under the radical sign. And in the last example, you can't have a denominator that is just a square root. As you can see from over here in the radical 2 over 4 example, it is okay that we have a radical 2 in the numerator. That's fine. But you can't have a radical in the denominator like we have over here with the radical 7. So let's do some practice problems and get this going. Oh, and really quickly, here is a brief summary of what was just talked about. If you need to pause the video to write down those reasons that you have a simplified and non-simplified radical, go ahead and do that. As another side note, by the way, over here in the top right corner, the number that is underneath the radical sign is called the radicand. R-A-D-I-C-A-N-D. Radicand. From time to time I use it, I usually don't say the word radicand, but just so you know, that is what the radicand is referring to. All right, really quickly, here's how you multiply radicals together. You have a property called the multiplication property of square roots. It's very straightforward. We already talked about it on the previous slide. If you have a number like 48, you could rewrite it as the square root of 16 times the square root of 3. 16 times 3 is 48, but because we're taking the square root of 48, you can rewrite the square root of 48 as the square root of 16 times the square root of 3. The square root of 16 would be 4, and you would get our answer 4 times the square root of 3. But keep in mind, this was already said on the previous slide, but uh, we did not want to use 24 times 2 to give us 48. And that's because 24 and 2 are not perfect squares. So you always want to find the largest perfect square. I can't stress that enough. This is something you want to write down. When you figure out the biggest perfect square that divides the number, you will be getting the problem done as quickly as you can. Also keep in mind that the opposite is true when you are multiplying square roots. If we were to, let's say, have an example, the square root of 6 times the square root of 8, well, you would just multiply 6 and 8, and you would get 48. 
And then the rest of the problem would proceed in the way that we were doing it before. You make 48 into 16 and 3. 16 is the largest perfect square that divides 48. And then you are left with your 4 when you square root the 16. And then the square root of 3 just tags along, and that's how you get your final answer. So let's do a practice problem. What is the simplified form of 160? If you need to pause the video, go ahead and do it, but the answer is going to come up in one moment. Okay, so let's say you didn't choose the best two numbers to multiply to give you 160. If you, let's say, made 160 into 2 times 80, well, neither 2 nor 80 are perfect squares. And if you made 80 into 2 times 40, well, you still don't have any perfect squares. 40 could be 2 times 20, still not going to get what you want. And then 20 could be 5 times 4. Now you have a perfect square, and that's 4. So you square root it and you get 2. And then the uh, two radical 2's up front would multiply to give you another 2. And then those two 2's would multiply to give you 4. And then your last two radicals, the 2 and the 5, they would stay under the radical sign and give you 10. So the answer is 4 times the square root of 10. Now that's a very complicated way of doing this. And it would be much easier if you just made 160 into 16 times 10. 16 is the largest perfect square that divides 160. Meaning, you can square root 16 and you will get 4. Whoops. You will square root 16, you will get 4, and then as you can see, you get the exact same answer. So again, when you have the largest perfect square that is dividing the number, you are going to be getting the answer in the quickest way possible. Here's another practice problem. Again, pause the video, work it out, and then hit resume. So here is the not as good choice for 72. If you made 72 into 9 times 8, well, you're taking the square root of 9 times the square root of 8. You would separate them using the multiplication property of square roots. The square root of 9 is 3, but you're not done yet, because 8 has a perfect square that divides it. Specifically, 8 can be radical 4 times radical 2, and that's how you have to write it down. You're not done when you have 3 radical 8, because 8 could be divided by another perfect square so you have to keep going. The 3 stays the same. And something else to keep in mind, whenever you have a number that is multiplying a radical, that will always involve a multiplication dot, but the dot might not be written there. So please keep that in mind. A number next to a radical sign, they are being multiplied together. In any case, we have a radical 4, and you would make the radical 4 become 2, and then your radical 2 at the end of the problem, well, that would just come down and be part of your final answer. 3 times 2 is 6, and the answer is 6 radical 2. This is the slightly longer way to do the problem, because there is a better choice that you could make for what the uh, perfect square is that divides 72. Do you know what it is? If you picked 36 and 2 then you made a good decision. Because the square root of 36, well, that's just 6. And you're done very, very quickly. So keep that in mind, again, for like the third or fourth time. When you find the largest perfect square that divides the number, you're going to get the answer as quickly as you can possibly get it. Now let's talk about variables, because you are going to get variables within these radicals. When you have an exponent, in general, your exponent is either going to be an even number or an odd number. So let's say you have an even exponent. Well, what you're basically getting is a perfect square. So look at this first example. We have x to the eighth power. That's a perfect square. You might not think it is because eight's not a perfect square, but you're taking x and you're raising it to the eighth power. That makes x to the eighth a perfect square. Because when you square root it, look at your answer you get x to the fourth power. The reason why you get x to the fourth power goes back to chapter 7 when you multiply two terms that have the same base. x to the fourth times x to the fourth equals x to the eighth. You add the two exponents because you are multiplying the variables together. So because x4 times x4 equals x8, the square root of x8 equals x to the fourth power. Likewise, if you were to have, let's say, x to the 60th power and square rooting it, well, you would basically just take the exponent and you would divide it by 2. And you would be left with x to the 30th power. 
But in any case, that is the basic rule for dealing with variables that have even exponents. Here's what happens when the exponent is odd. You're going to get a perfect square, but you're going to have to also multiply that perfect square by one copy of the variable. Here's the example. If you have y to the fifth power, 5 is an odd number. If you were to divide 5 by 2, like it says right here, you would get 2.5, and that's not what you want. Instead, you have to rewrite y to the fifth power as y to the fourth power times y to the first. Notice, 4 plus 1 is 5. y has the same base, and you are multiplying. When you're multiplying two variables with the same base, you add the exponents. So that means you can rewrite y to the fifth as y to the fourth times y to the first. We're just putting radical signs over them because that's the nature of the problem. The reason why you're going to do this is very simple. Your y to the fourth can now be simplified. You're square rooting y to the fourth, so that means you're going to get y squared. The last part is very simple. The radical y1 cannot be square rooted, so it just tags along for the final answer. So you get y2 times the square root of y. One more quick instance of this. Let's just say you had x to the 11th power, and you are square rooting it. Pause the video if you would like, and then work that one out. You would first rewrite x to the 11th as the square root of x to the 10th times the square root of x to the 1st. You take a single copy of the x variable so that the 11 goes from being odd to the number 10, which is even. And you can now square root x to the 10th, and you will get x to the 5th power. The radical x to the 1st, well, that just comes down and be would become part of the final answer. One more thing to keep in mind. Uh, and Let me just back this up and erase that orange text for one second. There we go. Something to keep in mind. The square root of y times the square root of y, well, that's just y. If you take the square root of any number times the square root of that same number, you get that number back. So, for example, the square root of 9 times the square root of 9 is going to equal 9. And that's because the square root of 9 is 3. And then the square root of 9 again is 3. And 3 times 3 equals 9. You're just not always going to have perfect squares in this example, which is why I'm using the number 9. In general, like the note says, anything that is being square rooted, if you multiply it by the same thing being square rooted, you get that same number back. Okay, moving on. Here's a practice problem. Pause the video if you want to work it out. All right, so the first thing you would do, you would take your 54 and you would find the largest perfect square that divides it. That would be 9 times 6, so you will have radical 9 times radical 6. The next part of the problem, you have the radical n to the 7th power also under there. You would want to rewrite that as the square root of n to the 6th times the square root of n. This is the hardest part of the problem. Once you get this out of the way, the rest of the problem is very, very downhill because you are just using your square roots. The square root of 9 is 3. And the square root of n to the 6th power, well, that's n to the 3rd power. The square root of 6 and the square root of n, they are just left to be like terms that would go under the same radical sign. So the 6 and the n stay under the radical sign. 6 is not a perfect square n cannot be square rooted. So the answer choice is C. Here's another practice problem. Feel free to pause the video again. All right, so don't be nervous when you see something like the negative m in front. You're still doing the same basic idea. What's the biggest perfect square that divides 80? Well, it's 16 and 5. So you would rewrite the square root of 80 as the square root of 16 times the square root of 5. You also have the m to the ninth power, and when you square root m to the ninth power, you would want to first rewrite it as m to the eighth power times m to the first power. 
This is the main part of the problem. The rest of this is very downhill. You square root m to the 8th power, and you get m to the 4th. You square root 16, and you get 4. Since the 5 is a prime number, and since the square root of m cannot be simplified any further, you are ready to write out your final answer. You need to take your like terms. All of the like terms are either not under radical signs, or they are all under radical signs. So you have a 4. That's going to get written down first. You have an m to the fourth power and a single m variable. Because of the commutative property, you can rearrange the order that these are written, and you can have the m and the m4 multiplying together. Because the m has an m1, and you're multiplying it with an m4, the result is going to be m5. Lastly, the 5 and the m that are under the radical signs are the only things that can't be reduced any further, so there isn't anything more to do with them, and you can just write them down as part of your final answer, the square root of 5m. Oh, and lastly, the negative sign in front of the m all the way over here at the beginning, that represents a negative 1 multiplying the entire problem. So the 4 just becomes negative, and that's your final answer. Here's another practice problem. This is what the end of course exam would more or less look like. The first thing you would want to do, here's the final answer, but look at what the writing is going to have. Your 2 and your 3 are both on the outside of the square root sign, so you would want to multiply them together first to get 6. Next, because the 7t and the 14t squared are both under the radical sign, you can go ahead and multiply them together, because they are like terms, and you can get 98 when you multiply 7 and 14, and you get t to the third power when you multiply t1 times t2. Now, what you have at this point in the problem is right here, 6 times the square root, of 98 times t to the third power. This problem is now basically the same problem that we did as the second example, which is very much like the first example. All we're doing is simplifying, so that's what I really need you to understand. Once you learn the procedure of how to simplify, you're basically doing the same problem conceptually with the numbers being a little different. Because the rest of this problem is very downhill. You now have a 98. So what is a perfect square that multiplies to give you 98? Well, that would be 49 and 2. You have a t to the third power. So you would break that into t squared and a t to the first power because the 3 is an odd number. The rest of this is very simple. You have the 49, which gets square rooted to the 7. You have t squared, which gets square rooted to t. And then you have the 2t over here that just tags along for the final answer. So basically, all you have left is a 7 multiplying a 6, and that gives you a 42t. So the final answer here would be 42t times the square root of 2t. Here's one for you to try on your own, though. It follows the exact same format as the one that you just saw. Pause the video if you need to. All right, so the first thing that you would want to do is multiply the 7 and the 3 to get 21. And because they're both on the outside of the radical signs, then you would want to multiply the stuff that's underneath the radical sign, the radicands. Well, the 5 and the 20 will multiply to make 100. And then the x with the 5, and then the x to the 5th power, those would add to give you an x to the 6th power. Remember, x times x to the 5th, because there's a 1 on the x, you would add the 1 and the 5, and you would get x to the 6th power. Next, the 100 gets square rooted to give you 10, and x to the 6th becomes x to the 3rd. 21 times 10 is 210, and that's the final answer. Here's one more property. It's very simple. It's called the division property of square roots. Basically, if you have a fraction underneath the radical sign from the previous slides, that is not something that you can have at the end of the problem. So as you can see, you are basically taking your fraction and you are separating it into the square root of whatever is in the numerator over the square root of whatever is in the denominator. 
Then you just simplify in the usual way. This is a very simple example. 36 gives you 6 and 49 gives you 7. So let's look at a slightly more complicated set of examples. Looking at problem A, you have radical 144 over 9. So the first thing that you would want to do is rewrite it as radical 144 over radical 9. Continuing, radical 144 becomes 12 and radical 9 becomes 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4. You don't have to write 4 over 1, I just chose to for the sake of it. It's the same thing as writing 4. Now in part B, here's how you could start the problem. You could take the 36a and make it its own square root. You could take the 4a cubed and you could make it its own radical as well. And you could continue the same procedure. Or you could notice something very, very simple. You have 36 in the numerator and a 4 in the denominator. 4 goes into 36 nine times. You also have an a1 in the numerator and an a cubed in the denominator. The same base is being divided. So remember, you can subtract the exponents on the variable a. Because a3 is in the denominator and 3 is larger than a1, you would have a 3 minus 1 giving you a 2 and a2 in the denominator. This entire fraction is being square rooted. And you can very easily see that the square root of 9 is 3 and the square root of a squared is just a. And that's the final answer done in a very quick fashion because again, you simplified your fraction first. Looking back at the purple writing, here is the longer way that you would have to deal with this problem if you did not simplify. So I really want you to simplify because it's going to make everything go a lot faster. Uh, your 36 would become 6 and the a would stay under the radical sign. Your 4 would become a 2 and the a to the third power, well you would first have to rewrite it because remember the 3 is odd. You rewrite it as a2 times a1 both under radical signs. 2 can go into 6 three times, and your radical a in the numerator and the radical a in the denominator, those would cancel out as well. So 2 would go into 6 three times, and then the radical a squared that is in the denominator, well, that's going to square root to give you a. And you have the exact same answer that we got up above. So again, I highly recommend, if you have a fraction, simplify it before you do all of this work. You could very easily save yourselves a lot of time. I would recommend pausing the video and trying to do problems C and D. So you should try to do that right now. Pause the video and then hit resume. In problem C, the first thing that you would do is rewrite it as the square root of 25y cubed over the square root of z squared. If you can do some of these steps in your head, that is perfectly fine. I will just be spelling everything out very clearly for the sake of the video. The square root of 25 is 5. Radical, or radical y cubed, that will become y times the square root of y. And the square root of z squared is just z. Oh, but before that, uh, radical y to the third power, if, if this part happened too quickly for you, basically the square root of y cubed would first get rewritten as the square root of y squared times the square root of y1, and then the square root of y squared, well, that would just become y. So the y that you see right here is the same y that is written right there. And then the radical y1 is right there. And then again, the square root of z squared, well, that's just z, and that's the final answer. In problem D, notice you have an 8 and a 50. Both are even numbers. You can divide both of those numbers by 2 to reduce your fraction, and you will get 4 over 25. Also notice, you have an x cubed in the numerator and an x in the denominator. The same base, they are being divided. This is an x1. So you're going to be doing 3 minus 1, which is 2. You have an x squared in the numerator. Because 4 and x squared and 25 are all perfect squares, you can just go ahead and square root all of those. You don't have to write it out as uh, the square root of 4x squared. Just go ahead and cut to the chase. The square root of 4 is 2. The square root of x squared is x. And the square root of 25 is 5. 
All right, so here's the part of the video that we actually didn't get to talk about in class. This is where you rationalize the denominator. Basically, you need to remove the radical sign from being in the denominator. It's okay if it's in the numerator, but it can't be in the denominator. So let's look at part A. It is okay that we have a radical 3 in the numerator, but it is not okay that we have a radical 7 in the denominator. This is very simple. Just like when you make common denominators with your fractions, you multiply the numerator and denominator by some number, you're going to multiply the denominator of this fraction by the square root of 7. And whatever you do to the bottom, you have to also do to the top. Watch what happens. The square root of 3 times the square root of 7, well, you're going to multiply those together and you're going to get 21, and that's fine. But in the denominator, you have the square root of 7 times itself. That will be 7, and that's the final answer. Remember, the goal is to rationalize the denominator. You don't want a radical in the denominator. You want it to be a whole number. Let's look at choice B. Let's look at answer uh, or problem B. So the radical 7 is perfectly fine, uh, but the thing about the radical 8, n radical 8 that has a perfect square that divides it you're going to want to simplify that first remember radical 8 can be radical 4 times radical 2 and radical 4 well that becomes 2 so this radical 4 became the 2 that you see right there listen carefully the radical 2 that you see right here is right there under a radical sign and then the n from right over here tags along and stays under the radical sign. And that's what you have once you simplify the denominator. We're not done yet. I'm just doing this because, again, the 8 has a perfect square that divides it. So you have to simplify the radical 8. Now we can rationalize the denominator because it says radical 2n. We are going to multiply both the denominator and the numerator by 2n. Well, in the numerator, 7 times 2 is 14, so you get the square root of 14n. And then your 2 tags along, but the square root of 2n times the square root of 2n, well, that's just 2n. So the radical 14n stays the same. 2 times 2 is 4, and that is your final answer. But here's what I'm going to do. Some of you might think, oh, well, why don't we just multiply the denominator by the square root of 8n and the numerator times the square root of 8n, right? Won't that work? Well, look at what happens. In the numerator, you get the square root of 56n. In the denominator, you get 8n. But here's the problem. 56 has a perfect square that can divide it. 56 can be rewritten as the square root of 4 times the square root of 14. Anytime you see a very large number, you should assume that there's a perfect square that can divide it to simplify. That's just a good general rule. Well, your denominator is perfectly fine, but your numerator still has to be simplified. The radical 4, that would become 2. And then your 14 stays the same, and your 8n stays the same. Well, we're almost to what our first answer looks like. You have a 2 in the numerator and an 8 in the denominator. 8 divided by 2 is 4. So there's the same answer. You get radical 14 over 4n. So many of these problems are based on just understanding the concept and then doing enough practice so you see all the different versions of what to expect. Here are three practice problems. I highly recommend you pause the video and try your hardest on doing these. We didn't talk about how to do this in class. We will talk about it in class tomorrow. Pause the video. Give it a shot. All right, so in part A, you have a radical 3 in the denominator. So you're going to multiply both the numerator and denominator by radical 3 because... Well, 2 times 3 is 6, but radical 3 times radical 3, it's 3. You're done, because 6 is not a perfect square. You can't do anything else to it. You're also done, because again, you cannot end the problem with a radical in the denominator. It has to be a whole number. In part B, the radical 5 stays the same. But you would want to simplify the 18 first. You need to realize that radical 18 could be radical 2 times radical 9. The M just tags along. Radical 9, well, that becomes 3. 
And then your 2 and m, they're both under radicals, so they're going to stay under the same radical. So this is how you would simplify the radical 18, so that you can now rationalize the denominator by multiplying by the square root of 2m. Remember, whatever happens to the bottom also happens to the top. The numerator, you get the square root of 10m, the 3 tags along, and then the radical 2m times itself, well, that's going to be 2 times m. Numerator stays the same, 3 times 2 is 6. The last example, I'm going to do that over here. You could first separate your fraction, radical 7s over radical 3. Next, multiply the numerator and denominator by radical 3 to make the denominator become 3. In the numerator, 7 times 3 is 21. The s tags along under the radical sign. Radical 3 times itself, that's 3, and that's the end. All right, guys, here's a bunch of practice problems for you to do. And uh, I'm just going to quickly fast forward through even more practice problems, pause the video as, as uh, need be. Um, all of these problems, most of these problems are going to get worked out, but I'm going to put that in another video. But I at least want you to be exposed to some more practice problems. So pause if you need to pause. I'm going to advance through the rest of this very quickly to get the video done. There's all the work, but I'm going to put all the work in a different video, so don't worry about that. I mean, if you want to look through it, cool. Pause. Um, otherwise, this is going to be in, a, in another video. Here are the solutions to the first 35 problems that you just looked at. Pause. Check your answers. Oh, whoops. There we go. Here are more practice problems. Oh, but they're all getting erased. Let me fix that. Let's see. There we go. Here are some more practice problems. Uh, pause the video again, work them out. I erase a bunch of these and I work some of them out, but I'm gonna again put that in another video. So I'm just gonna skip to that right now. Okay, cool. Uh, those problems are worked out. You can kind of see the work shown right there. And then on the next slide, we're gonna have the answers. And there are all the answers. And here's one more wave of practice problems. Oh, the answer's already worked out. Let me back that up so you can pause the video and actually do it correctly. There we go. And let's see. There we go. Okay, everything's worked out. Yeah, cool. And there are the solutions. All right. So I hope you practice these problems. Please come to class and ask questions. I know this is a lot. I know this is a long video, but... The better prepared you are with this material, the easier Chapter 10 is going to go. Have a good day, guys, and I will see you tomorrow in class.